Welcome to Private for Public, a deeper look at Maine's delicate and often complicated tradition of public access to private land. Brought to you by the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Hey everyone, this is episode one of Private for Public, and I'm your host, Chris McCabe. And today, I'm joined by my colleague and friend, private lands wildlife biologist Joe Roy, to discuss how strategic land management can bring a diversity of species to your property. Yeah, my name is Joe Roy, private lands wildlife biologist here for the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Uh, Essentially, I cover the whole state, all 22 million plus acres, and I assist private landowners as they try to achieve their wildlife habitat goals. So sometimes that looks like helping a small landowner in a suburb area make their backyard more friendly for pollinators. Other times it's working with an industrial landowner who might have a million acres who's looking to do some wildlife habitat improvement and uh, everything in between. Nice. So you work with everyone in the state of Maine that is owner of land. Yeah, if you own any property in the state, and you're interested in wildlife habitat, and you have questions, I can help you. Nice. So is there any particular habitat that you prefer over anything? In Maine, 89% forested. So the vast majority of my work is with forested landowners. I really like working on projects where people are trying to figure out how to achieve their wildlife habitat goals for species that they're interested in, while they're also trying to achieve goals for forestry management, whether it's a commercial harvest or making sure they get enough firewood for the winter. So helping them kind of have their cake and eat it too. So I need six cord of wood off this, but I also want to have more habitat for songbirds and other species of wildlife like bear or deer. And I started talking about different ways they can do that. So that's kind of where I like the forested landscape a lot. So with that being said, I mean, everybody thinks of the department being... Uh, big game species, moose, deer, uh, you help manage for that. But what other types of species would you help manage for if if they were interested in it? I'm glad you brought this up because actually a lot of times when I'm meeting with landowners, I ask them, like, how many species of wildlife do you think we have here in the state of Maine? People are like, oh, a couple hundred. Um, it's over 15,000. So a lot of those are invertebrates. And if you want to manage for dragonflies, and you've got the right habitat, I can give you guidance. I can help you figure that out. And some people do. Um, But no, of the 15,000 plus species we have here in the state, there are far more that are non-game species that aren't hunted than there are game species that are hunted. So I do a lot of work with landowners looking to manage for songbird habitat. Um, A lot of people looking just to manage for a good small mammal habitat. Um, because they know it's an important part of the uh, of the landscape. So really, I would say I spend probably 70% of my time working with people managing who aren't necessarily managing for a hunting goal. So the average landowner just says, I want it to look healthy. I want to have a diversity of species. How can I do that? You know, so. so with that being said, I mean, there's a lot on the landscape here and there's a lot of animals that people don't think of like you said like the dragonflies and songbirds and stuff are there specific critical habitat out there that you would help manage people like the cottontail down in Mm -hmm. southern maine that's a big deal is there is there specific management that you could help these people out with for specific creatures like that yeah so what really drives me is what the landowner wants to manage for so I always like to tell people when I show up, like, I'm not in the business of telling you what to do with your property or how to manage your property. I'm going to give you what I know. I'm going to tell you what I know to occur here. And if that's something you're interested in, we can work on managing for it. So the state has done a really good job. of We've mapped a lot of our important wildlife habitats. So it might be uh, wood turtles. We know that they are occurring in certain water bodies um, along certain stretches of river and if a landowner owns property near there I'll let them know we know this is here if it's something you're interested in managing for same thing like you said with the New England cottontail Uh, there's some focus areas that the state has developed especially in the southern part of the state that show where the species is still occurring and uh, where 
it could expand to to backfill its historic range. So if people are in that area, I'll let them know, like, here's a management priority that a lot of other organizations have. You happen to be in that area. Now, the cool thing is if you have a goal for one of those species, sometimes that opens up new opportunities and brings in more people who might have some other technical service that they can provide, maybe some financial assistance that they could provide. So when I start talking to landowners about that, they might say, I didn't know I had that. That sounds really cool to me, and it sounds like there are people working on this. I'd like to get involved um, in whatever way I can. So the cottontail might be an example of, we know cottontails used to be here historically, but they're not now, and you're interested in them. Well, why aren't they here? Well, let's take a look at your landscape. You have a well-developed forest. Um, you might have bought the property 30 years ago and haven't done any harvest since then. Pri your prior owner might have been um, a farmer. So there might have been better early successional plant communities 40 plus years ago. You don't have any more. Now we can start saying, while there aren't cottontail here, there are cottontail in the town nearby. You could do some forest management now that might turn that into habitat that could be occupied in the future. So kind of helping there. So, so with that, like, I mean, Warden Service, we deal a lot with nuisance wildlife and wildlife conflict with people and stuff. What are the issues that you see when you talk to landowners about some wildlife conflicts that they may have and how can you help them out? Yeah, so a lot of times conflict that people might have, um, a, a pretty common one might be over browsing by deer on their woodlot. Uh, so they're trying to grow a good understory and there's nothing left uh, because the deer have come in and browsed it all. So sometimes, depending on how dense the population is there, we can talk about, well, hey, look, there's, there hasn't been much of an understory here for a while. Maybe we can do a harvest um, that starts regenerating uh, understory. And if you do a large enough harvest, uh, you know, the deer may not be able to come in and browse it all before it grows. Or maybe let's talk about leaving some slash behind to kind of protect that regeneration a little bit. So that's some of the stuff that I deal with. Sometimes there's not a good on the ground management solution so it's calling you know uh up the warden service saying is there anything we can do to help this this farmer out they're dealing with a lot of predation of their crop so with some of the things like with landowner conflicts like with wildlife we always get calls from the warden service perspective where people are looking for assistance in that mm -hmm. and where are some of the things that you could help out a landowner with nuisance wildlife one example um you know, I'm following up with the landowner, Chris, that you had sent me. He's got a mixed-use uh, farm, so he does a few different types of crops. Um, he's got a bit of a crop rotation, and he's got a lot of uh, deer getting in and, and really eating a bunch of his, uh, his crop before he can bring it to market. And him and I just discussed today the opportunity to take some of his field margins and maybe plant it in a forage that would uh, be more palatable to the deer and kind of see if we he can spend, get them tied up a little bit more in that in that land while his crops are growing to really a little bit of pressure from there. Not exactly sure if it will work or not, but at the end of the day, he knows he's going to be providing good wildlife habitat in a marginal part of his field that he already doesn't have in production. And we're going to monitor moving forward over the next couple of years to see how that works out. Um, that's one way I can think about doing it. And then, like, I do a lot of other just basic outreach with people. So I've got an issue with bears. It's like, well, where are the bear coming in? It's like, they keep coming in and getting my dumpster, or they keep coming to my grill, or they keep coming to my bird feeders or whatever. So I just then go kind of move into the whole, you know, just wildlife interaction management uh put my wildlife interaction management hat on at that point like well let's remove the, the the attractant let's see what's going on there you know or it's the breeding season so they're going to be more active right now but it should slow down so that sort of stuff but sometimes there are opportunities to manipulate the habitat uh, to make it a little bit more uh, wildlife friendly somewhere else on your property where you might not want the wildlife so you got 400 acres and something's going on in your backyard and the deer getting in your garden or whatever, maybe we can look at doing some real awesome management on the back 40, and it might hold deer up there longer. It's really 
It's really hard telling because sometimes we do everything right and you're still going to have those issues. But. So with that being said, I mean, you must work with the landowners to provide the background that hunting is a good thing. Yeah. And these are opportunities for our hunters in the state of Maine to take advantage of a situation where these people are having crop loss or yeah. having damage to their property. So do you encourage them to open their land for hunting if that is, if it is not, and that this would be a good thing for our department? Yeah, I have a lot of conversations about that. So oftentimes, I mean, I can't think of a single scenario where someone's told me that they're having an issue with a species that is able to be legally hunted, and I haven't said, do you allow hunting and fishing on the property or trapping, or are you open to that? And for a lot of people, they're saying, no, I don't, but do you think that could help? And I start the conversation of, well, I'm not necessarily saying if someone comes in here and shoots one deer, your problem goes away, but it can help disrupt movements. Um, it can help introduce, you know, some behavior that might cause the animals to be a little bit more wary, maybe not standing in your backyard. And I always try to advocate for that because, you know, as you know, here in the state, you know, 94% privately owned. Um, we cannot provide the hunting and fishing opportunities necessary on the 6% of public land. And it would be overcrowded. It wouldn't be necessarily sustainable. And I try to help make those relationships. And sometimes people will be like, you know what? I just don't know how to invite hunters out here. Or, or having conversations about explaining access. Like someone might say, yeah, you know, I don't mind hunters being out here. But I always come up here Thanksgiving week with my family. And I, I really just want us to have that space on our own. And that's where I tell people it. I don't know if you realize this, but you can just tell the access, the people accessing your property, hey, my rule is you can hunt every week besides Thanksgiving. And you can write that down. You can build that into your agreement and that it can make it work, you know. So. Yeah. So and then the liability thing, too. I have a lot of folks, especially um, folks who are moving in um, that have never owned property before. They might be a first-time property owner here in Maine, or they might have come from another state where they don't realize that the liability laws make it so the landowner is not held liable for those sorts of, so any sort of injury that are incurred, occur, that happened to, you know, land users. And so with some folks, I tell them that, they're like, oh, well, that was my big concern. I was just worried if someone fell out of a tree stand, I, I'd be in trouble. And I kind of answer those questions for them. And then Oftentimes we can help maybe connect them to people in the area. Yeah, I mean, definitely that comes up a lot with landowner liability, like for Rick and I. Um, people want to know, like, if they're with the change of real estate in the last couple of years, like new people moving in, uh, understanding that they, they're not liable for people recreating on their property, whether that's snowmobiling, ATVing, or anything like that, that if they have a trail through there. So I think that is an important part of it is that. Uh, like for you, especially when you're out there do, giving FaceTime to all these landowners, it's reassuring them that mm -hmm. not only like hunting season and having people hunt their property is biologically good. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, it's a needed thing for us as an agency for us to have proper management of wildlife in the state. Yeah. So you're not only helping the landowner manage their property as to what they specifically want, whether it's wildlife habitat or anything like that, but you're also doing the wildlife management side for our department, for our deer biologists or yeah. moose biologists and bear biologists that need the data in order to have healthy populations. I like to think I'm doing all those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times it's just answering questions that people don't know and just helping with that outreach. And like I said, you know, we know we need there to be access to private land for hunting and fishing here in the state of Maine based off the amount of users we have, their geographic distribution, and the lack of public land. So just advocating for that as part of my discussion about healthy populations when people were asking about it. So. so with that being said, I mean, you deal with a lot of different groups. You're dealing with municipalities, land trusts, private landowners, small and large. Mm -hmm. And like what, with each one, what is different and what what are you seeing that's similar with those types of landowners? For a lot of the landowners, there's a lot of different goals and objectives. A lot of times, so like you said, I deal with small landowners, medium landowners, industrial landowners, uh, municipal landowners, uh, NGOs that own land, uh, people who, who hold uh, organizations who hold conservation easements. So they're in that whole list of people, which I think covers like everyone in the state, uh, there's different goals. Oftentimes, when I'm dealing with, let's say, a, a land trust, they might have more of a, a preservation model. 
So they're, they're taking kind of a more hands-off approach and saying, we want to have this become an ecological reserve where we're not harvesting trees or anything like that. We're going to maintain a couple of, of small trails. And so for them, they might say, we're fine to hunting and fishing, but we really want to limit motorized access because we're trying to have this be foot traffic only. So, yeah, we can figure that out. For other landowners, they're saying, you know, um, I just inherited this land from my family. Uh, you know, we haven't had a harvest here in a long time. You know, making a little bit of money off the land is important to me. My daughter's going to college and I want to help pay for that. Uh, but, you know, my other daughter is an avid hunter and she really says, Dad, you know, I don't want you to take all the way the opportunity to deer hunt there. So I start having those conversations like, well, let's talk about patch cuts. Let's talk about thinning. Um, let's figure out ways to, to help improve the condition of the habitat for deer on your property while at the same time making sure that you can have uh, that financial product that you're that you're looking for. Uh, other landowners, they're really just focused on um, just the harvest. They're saying that the money is the most important thing for me here and wildlife is kind of the second. So first off, there's if there's any species of real conservation need or concern there, I just make them aware of them. Um, and so they might say, well, fine, I'm going to stay away from that area, but i got to harvest everywhere else. And then it might just look like me getting them in contact with a consulting forester um, in the area to say, you know, hey, this person's really driven by a harvest for, for money or something like that. And then I had the landowners who were like, I don't care how much money I have to spend on my property. I want it to be a hunting mecca for my family. So they're like, I have farm equipment. I have access to seed. I have a skitter. Tell me what I need to do to make this the best place I can possibly possibly hunt. And a lot of times I learn more from those landowners than I can teach them because they've been doing it on the ground for a long time. I think of a guy up in um, northern Maine up near Limestone who, I mean, he's got crops that he's planting for forage year round for the wild for wildlife. He's got forest management that he's doing and he's, you know, just investing tons and tons of money in his property just for, for the hunting and fishing opportunities for his daughter and him and a couple of their friends nearby. So it's everything in between there, you know. So with that, like, I mean, we watch all the hunting shows and stuff and food plots seem to be uh, all the rage now mm -hmm. and everybody growing like supplemental crops like that. So have you seen an increase in that, like with the hunting community that they they want to grow their own crops just to manage the deer? I get asked about that a lot. Um, and I don't know if maybe it's like my old school Western foothills and Maine approach to just uh, picking through the woods slowly, but uh, I've never been a huge like food plot guy. I think in some places it works really well. But in other places, I'll, I'll meet with landowners and it's like, you know, you've got soil that's pretty shallow to expose ledge here. Uh, it's super acidic. You don't have access to get in equipment or machinery. Um, it's going to be an uphill battle. You know, are you, are you prepared to, you know, hoof in bag after bag of lime every year? What, what's your water source looking like? So it's not always the right fit for, for landowners. For landowners, like the one I just talked to you about, he's he's looking more for, to manage too many deer. But for a lot of the farmers, it's like, what are what, what can I do with the margins of these fields anyways? So they're out there with the equipment. They have the access to the seed. They understand their soil chemistry. For them, I might say, yeah, it's a bit of a better approach. Um, for some people, they said, I just had a harvest and I, I already got to close out my harvest. Is there anything I can plant instead on this old log landing to build a little bit of a food plot? And I can give them some guidance there. Um, it's not my favorite tool in the toolbox, but I still I still talk with people about it. But I think a lot of people, habitat management's conceptually kind of hard to wrap your head around. It's like, I'm going to tell you, hey, why don't we come in here and we do these things that are going to change the way the forest looks to you, but drastically change the way it looks for wildlife. And then the wildlife could respond, but it might take two or three years. Sometimes that's hard to get your head around, whereas people want to say, if I go out and I clear this plot of land and I plant clover, I'm going to see that growing. And then if I see a deer in there, I know that I've made the habitat, as you know, quotes there. And I think that that's why sometimes people are drawn towards those, those sorts of things. But it isn't always the best tool in the toolbox because, you know, you might have really good bedding habitat on your property for the wildlife you're looking for. Or you might have really great den site for bears. Or you might already have... Um, 
a different element of habitat, that water component or that uh, cover component. So if you tried to change that into a food source, you might be kind of messing with the movements already. So I don't try to get into telling people how to deer hunt or how to hunt or whatever, because there's a million different ways to do that. But uh, I think that the food plot thing is a lot of people ask about it because it seems more hands-on. And I don't, it works sometimes for some people. I don't always think it's the best solution for everyone. And I think a benefit of all of the hunting shows and things online that people are seeing a lot of different stuff. But sometimes you got to think too about the ecosystem you're in. You know, there's a big difference between the habitat utilized by deer in Iowa versus by Maine. You know, we know there's a lot of browsing done. There's a lot of uh, uh, movement through the, through the woods. There's a seasonal movement to wintering yards, that sort of stuff. It's very different than, you know, deer that are living on huge agricultural landscapes. So. This is the Talking Trash segment where we're going to talk about illegal dumping as one of the leading causes of private land being shut down for public access. In this episode of Talking Trash, we're going to talk about a serial dumper. A year ago, Maine Game Wardens removed a large boat from the Androscoggin River in Durham, Maine that had been abandoned. The boat was a large bay liner, cabin cruiser, bearing New Hampshire hull number 5091B Boston G. George that had been abandoned in the river and tied up along the shore. This was the second boat the Game Wardens had removed from this area in the last year. More recently, a boat trailer was dumped and left at the Sabatis Lake boat launch. The boat was brown and tan, century hull number 7771, A. Adam, C. Charles. The boat was removed and recycled. If you have any information in regards to these illegal dumping cases, please contact your local authorities. Reporting this illegal activity will allow for us to continue catching the intentional violator as we try to keep our waterways clean and pristine in the great state of Maine. As William Stack said from Unsolved Mysteries, join me, perhaps you may be able to solve a mystery. So with that, you, you mentioned earlier that like you work with a bunch of different partners and may assist a landowner and kind of sending them in the direction of another partner. What are some of the partners that you, you would use in uh, for a landowner that's looking for assistance? Yeah, I'm glad you asked because this is something that I think not a lot of people know about here in the state of Maine. Um, you know, it's just a bit of a different uh, uh, cultural land uses than in than other parts of the country. Um, you know, there's a couple big things that come to mind for me. First off is the Maine Forest Service has a program uh, that funds forest management plans. And it's through the Forest Stewardship Program. And they, they take federal dollars and they help them get into the hands of landowners who are looking to get a forest management plan for their property. And here in Maine, those plans are called Woodland Resource Action Plans, WRAP or RAPs is what we call them. And in the world of land management, we're going to have a lot of acronyms. So, <laughs> so we're going to start with RAP. Uh, that is a, a forest management plan written by a stewardship forester. That's a forester who's a certified forester here in the state of Maine because uh, all foresters uh, have to be certified to write forest prescriptions and stuff like that. But they've also gone to get a certification to become a stewardship forester. So they've filled out paperwork and they've you know, made sure they've taken the right classes and they're certified to write these plans here in the state of Maine. And these plans are really comprehensive plans to have your stand type, your soil types, lay out your goals and objectives, um, give you a timeline of what practice should happen when, an estimated cost. So sometimes they might say, you know, this stand should be thinned in 10 years. It could cost you this much, but in other situations, it might say that thinning would probably net you this much dollars. So it helps lay out your 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 um your goals and helps you create a plan for the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And the big thing with for with habitat management is I always push people like get a plan. It's so easy to say, here's what I want to do over the next five years, and then ten years later you're like, Oh, I forgot to do that because I got busy, you know, and the plan helps with that. So I would say the first step would be, you know, that woodland resource action plan with the main forest service is one I think of a lot. 
Another resource that I think of that has a financial benefit to the landowners would be um, getting in contact with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, or NRCS. This is a nationwide organization that falls under the USDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and they assist producers, agricultural producers, with a whole slew of things. So by agricultural producers, it's anyone who's producing food or fiber. So that could be a vegetable crop, that could be uh, cattle, that could be a dairy operation, that could be forestry. So food or fiber. And they have a whole list of programs that create a financial incentive or provide a financial uh, assistance for certain practices. So like that Woodland Resource Action Plan I mentioned that the main Forest Service is paying uh, a part, part of the cost for, the NRCS pays for forest management plans as well. So they pay at a pretty uh, higher, a little bit higher payment rate than Maine Forest Service. There's a few more boxes to check, uh, but same idea. You get a forest management plan, um, or you can get a nutrient management plan if you're in an agricultural setting or anything like that. And that lays out all the opportunities there are to manage your, your wildlife and your forest. And they break it down, same idea. By stand, you have soil types, and then once you get this plan written, um, you bring it back to the NRCS after they've approved you ahead of time and they say yep this plan meets our specifications here's the money that we agreed to pay for this plan. For those plans you need to use what's called a technical service provider which is a TSP and in Maine they're usually um, licensed foresters who've gone through and made sure that they filed all the appropriate paperwork and shown that they understand how to write these plans. So after you get that plan written you can start applying to get money to implement some of the practices that you have um, it built in. So for example, in my personal life, I got one of these plans done on a woodlot I have up in Eustis, about 33 acres. Got a forest management plan written, hired a local forester, did a great job. Um, super comprehensive plan, sat down and talked to them about my goals and objectives. He walked the site, figured out you know what was reasonable, figured out what we had there, and we made this plan. Now, I just applied for funds to help offset the cost of a pre-commercial thinning because my forest stand is overstocked. Um, it makes it, it's really dense. It's uh, got some forest health concerns. Things aren't growing as well as they could. And so I applied and was approved as a private citizen for these funds to help, uh, help offset the cost of that, uh, that thinning. And the, the logic behind the NRCS is that, you know, wildlife is managed in the public trust. Everyone is an equal owner of the wildlife here in the United States. That's a, the North American model of wild conservation. And we all want clean air, clean water. We all have rights to that as well. So they are funding activities that improve those things, improve water quality, improve air quality, improve soil quality, improve wildlife habitat. So that's the logic behind funding this on the private landscape because we know that private landowners own all that land and they own all that habitat. And they ha they, they're the ones who own the property that feeds into the water that affects water quality. So there's those opportunities there to help fund that sort of stuff. The NRCS is really cool. Um, they have a footprint in every county in the United States. And they're oftentimes located in the same building as your soil and water conservation district, which is what a lot of people are, are familiar with locally. And you can go in there and you get you knock on the door or you talk to someone like me, we get you connected and start walking through the process of what you're looking to do and they figure out what programs might work for you. They tell you what programs that they have. Uh, you might decide to go pursue a program that you didn't know about before, but they really help bring uh, technical dollars and get them on the landscape. And they also have a ton of uh, technical experts on different things, whether it's manure management, uh, soil uh, quality, uh, you know, engineers that help design bridges for you to move your equipment across from if you got to get to a field that you don't have access to they fund that sort of stuff they're they're really a great a great place to uh, get involved so there's a lot of funding resources out there for these landowners that are looking to do things with their land that they may not have the money to do or yep. the expertise to do yeah and that's the thing is that's what NRCS and Bay Forest Service and people like me are here for is to say here's the technical assistance component like 
Here's answering your questions. Here's getting you the information you need for management. And then NRCS has that pool of money for implementation. So what they're saying is we understand that sometimes doing it the right way might be more expensive. I think of, I mean, Chris, think of how many culverts you've crossed that were done the wrong way because, you know, you probably should have put an 18-inch culvert in there, but you only had two 6-inch culverts. So you put them next to each other, and then and then that's how you crossed. Um, and they understand that that 18-inch culvert might be expensive. The earthwork involved might be expensive. But we know that that helps fish passage if we can get a larger crossing. We know that it helps improve water quality. So they're saying, we're going to help put our money where our mouth is. We're, we're saying that these are all these great things that you could be doing on the landscape. We understand they're expensive, so we're going to help offset the cost of that. So a lot of times it ends up being, you know, the same out-of-pocket cost for landowners if they were going to do it the original way, but there's a lot more benefit because now they've got a better crossing. So what was going to be an undersized culvert is now a small bridge, and they can get their tractor across there, and they can get to their wood lot, but at the same time, now... They're opening up two miles of stream for brook trout to travel up. They're opening up uh, two miles of stream to get more uh, mink moving up and all that sorts of stuff. So so I can see like how excited you get like helping landowners when you're talking about this. And like I know from our perspective, from the warden service side of landowner relations, like how exciting it is for us to help landowners and yeah. to create the public access. What are some of the projects that you're working on currently that just like are a good sample for the people out there that would be like, hey, where can we go from here? And what what excited what is exciting for you at this time? I just wrapped up working or I'm about to wrap up working on this project. So or I should caveat, I just listed a couple partners that we work with, but there's plenty of other partners I work with for education and outreach and stuff like that. So one of them I'm gonna talk about here is called Ag Allies. Uh, they are based out of a soil and water conservation district here in Maine. I just worked with them for the last couple weeks out in the field every morning uh, doing some surveys with them. They're focused on increasing the opportunity for um, some species of greatest conservation need here in the state of Maine uh, that rely on fields. So a species of greatest conservation need is identified by our state as a species that might not necessarily be endangered or threatened at the state or federal level. But the data suggests that it's heading in the wrong direction. That might be because of habitat loss. That might be because of uh, climate change. That might be because of land use changes, um, a slew of other things. So we have this great plan called the State Wildlife Action Plan that highlights what species are greatest conservation need and what actions we need to take to help keep those species on the landscape. So long, long-winded beginning to this. But this project that I just worked on was with Agriculture Allies, Ag Allies, and we went out to all these landowners who said, hey, I've got these these rare or less than common birds like bobolink and eastern meadowlark in my field, and I really like them. How do I make sure they, st- they stay here? So for them, the big thing is the usually the first mowing of the year for hay uh, crushes the nests, but we know that they fledge around July 15th. So what I just spent the last couple weeks doing is going out with these interested landowners and walking the edge of their field doing surveys and telling them whether they have these birds or not. And if if they had the birds, I say, hey, listen, here's ways we can mitigate this. Step number one would be to, to not mow this field until after July 15th, after the birds have fledged. Because the young, after they fledge, it takes them about 10 days or so before they're strong enough to sustain flight to fly away as the mowing is happening behind them. That's step one. If they say, Joe, I got to graze my cattle here. There's no way I can avoid um, grazing there, or I need to cut this hay. There's no way I can avoid it throughout this whole complex of fields. But I, I do care about these species. So I'd go out and say, hey, let's look at this area in particular. The center of this field is where the vast majority of this activity is happening. Um, do you want me to put up some stakes and we can outline it? And if you can just avoid that area until July 15th? Would that work? And they're like, actually, you know what? I usually start grazing from the outside and work my way in anyways. I can do that. Or they might say, you know, the guy who mows my hay is mowing it for mulch hay. He's not getting a high-quality product, so he can wait another week, no problem, and just mow me last. So I just did that with landowner, about 100 landowners across the state this organization has been working with, and we partnered with them this year to help raise that 
uh, awareness. And they had a little bit of money available too. So some landowner said, I really can't afford to give it up until July 15th. And they, we found them some dollars to say, well, there's a little bit of money that could help offset that. So it wasn't enough to offset the loss of a crop, but it might be enough to say, hey, we know you got to move your equipment there to mow, and then you got to move along. And then if you have to come back to it, that's more diesel and time it takes to get your equipment back. Would this be enough money to cover that? And they're saying, yeah, actually, that works out really well. Because ultimately, everyone I work with, they care about wildlife. They care about doing what's right. They don't, no one tells you, I love running over baby bird nests, you know. <laughs> but at the same time, they got mouths to feed. They got a family to feed. They got a, a roof to keep over their heads. So that was one of my favorite projects so far this year because, you know, coming from a community where people are still making a lot of their living off of food that they're growing and from trees that they're cutting down in forestry, it's really nice to be able to go back to communities like that that I grew up in, I still live in, and say, let's let's make it all work. And we found a way to do that for a bunch of landowners statewide, which is pretty cool. That's um, awesome. And then the cool thing about that is that once you start doing something right for one species, and this example, the bobolink, which is a kind of bird, everyone calls it the Star Wars bird because it sounds like one of the drones from Star Wars when it sings. Once you start doing that, think about what else benefits from having tall grass into mid-July. You know, your turkeys are going to like that. Your 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 deer fawns are going to be out there. Um, we know that sometimes they're running away from the, the mowing deck too. That gives them that little refuge there uh, until July. Um, that leaves a lot more opportunity for pollinators to get some of those early season flowers that might get initially cut down. It's just the the cascading effect there is so good. And I tell people it's cool with something like that because I know I'm helping a couple species in particular. But we're kidding ourselves if we tell you we understand all of ecology. It's so complex that we just know that that downstream impact is also super great. So that was a really cool project to work on. That is really cool. And I know that like that reached out to like everyone because I know that Emily mentioned to me she had a podcast on fishing game changers about how songbirds, the decline in songbirds, and I'm very particular about my lawn and mm-hmm. mowing fields and everything like that. And it really resonated with her and me to the point of like, I'm not bush hogging right now. I'm going to hold off to bush hog the fields because really, like you said, I mean, it's not just the songbirds, it's the turkeys, it's the fawns. Mm-hmm. They really it's rely the on that. that. Everything's eaten. Um, you know, it, if you wait, let's say to mow your lawn, probably a month longer than most people would want to wait. Let's say you're mowing it at the beginning of June. You'll notice that in front of your mowing deck, you'll see mice running around. You'll see voles. You'll see um, these small little violets that are starting to bloom. You'll be scaring the bees off those, things that normally wouldn't get to grow. So it's one of those things. It's like so much wildlife just looking at that lawn and just being like, man, I can't wait till that grows tall. And then it doesn't. So it's one of those things that you start thinking about, well, what do I care more about? Do I care about a lawn that looks like a fairway or do I want more wildlife in my backyard? 99% 99% of the people I'm working with want more wildlife in their backyard. So that's a perfect way to do it right there. And what's cool about this job is sometimes it's just that making that outreach. With that example you shared, Chris, of like, I heard that this was a good thing to do. So I said, I'll save myself some, I'll save myself the weekend time. I'll save myself the gas and uh, I might actually get more, more wildlife. And then I start telling people, like, think about this. That's just a field in your backyard that you don't do too much with. But now, if you have kids or grandkids, you can start pointing out all the birds that are coming in. You point out the wildlife. You see a deer coming in one morning. Kids love that. I mean, we all love that. So it's a really good way to kind of, and all of a sudden you start looking and you're like, wow, I've never noticed that flower before. Oh, I didn't realize that those flowers grew in because some of these things, they're only, they don't bloom until July. So all of a sudden you're seeing them. Or we get some flowers that don't bloom until October or late September, New England aster. Um, great pollinate, great for pollinators. Nice, beautiful purple flower. It, uh, we don't see it as much because we, we're mowing, you know. And then all of a sudden, you get a lot more insect life. You get a lot more bird life. You get birds getting ready to migrate that have a lot more food to, food to eat now. Um, you know, starts addressing some of those declines and uh, a lot less maintenance for your property too. You know, messy is good. That's awesome. No, that's great. And. Uh... I really appreciate you coming in today, Joe. This has been a great opportunity to talk and uh, 
I'm sure we'll be reaching out. Like I'll be sending landowners your way, and yeah, you'll be yeah, sending them do. My you know, way. Uh, people can reach me on the website. I do visits with landowners statewide. Um, you know, sometimes I, I book out quite a bit in advance. So if you shoot me an email, um, I get back to you, and I come out and walk your property and give you some advice and answer your questions and uh, connect you with all the people that we talked about today. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks so much for listening. If you would like to learn more about Maine's Beginning with Habitat program, visit mefishwildlife.com backslash beginning with habitat. Be sure to tune in next week as I talk with Doug Duran, the founder of Sharing the Land Initiative, to learn more about how he is working to redefine the relationship between hunters, landowners, and nature. In the meantime, do your part to help protect Maine's tradition of access to private land by being a responsible land user and showing your appreciation and support for Maine's private landowners.